All right. Welcome back, party people. Hello and welcome to Office Hours with me, Brent Ozar. Um, back in my home studio in Reykjavik, I've been out on the road. We're in Iceland until early October, and Erica and I have been alternating between working for one to two weeks and then being out on the road for one to two weeks. Uh, and we just got back into Reykjavik after driving all over the central highlands and the north of Iceland, Husavik. Uh, and you may have seen, if you've been watching my YouTube channel, um, you may have seen office hour sessions happening all over Iceland, because what I did is I shuttled my cameras around, or one of my cameras around, and did uh, uh, office hour sessions over all throughout the uh, country. Those were disconnected because, of course, I didn't have any uh, high-speed internet when I'm out running around throughout the entire country. But now I'm back in Reykjavik, so I actually have high-speed internet. Oh, I absolutely love it. Uh, Jared says, any favorite spots? One of my favorites that we saw this time around was the Thieves Waterfall. Uh, it has something to do with uh, a bunch of thieves being chased down here or there in, uh, you know, a thousand years ago. Uh, but an utterly epic, beautiful spot and pretty far off the radar. Uh, there was another one. Now I'm going to have to go back and think of what it was. There was another... Um, Oh, the, the Lava Church, the Lava Church in the Central Highlands. There's a beautiful uh, church basically made out of lava formation uh, by, by nature, not by man, but just utterly beautiful. And if you follow me on Instagram or go look at my Instagram feeds, I'm Brento over there. I'm either Brento or Brenos are. I think I'm Breno on Instagram. I have uh, uh, oh, tons of photos over there. Mossy, Mossy, Moss, good to see you. Welcome back. Yeah, I haven't been streaming live in a long time. Um, so let's go get to the questions. Let's go hit what y'all's top voted question is. And it looks like it is from Steve, Steve Lipson. Steve says, how can I figure out if my SQL server has too much or not enough memory? Also, for those of y'all who are posting in questions, make sure to read the URL up at the top. That gives you where you can post questions. I won't be taking any question, questions from like the live chat. They all have to go up from there. Hi, David Sanchez. Um, or David, I should say, I believe it is. Uh, so how can I figure out if my SQL server has enough memory? This is such a good question, and I'm going to twist around and ask the opposite. How do you know if your SQL server doesn't have enough memory? Well, you'll usually see page I.O. latch as your top wait type. Page I.O. latch means that SQL Server is waiting to read data pages from the data file. In that case, you don't have enough RAM to cache all of those data pages. I'm not saying that the only fix is to add RAM, but RAM hides a lot of sins, and that's one of the sins that it hides if you don't have very good indexes, if your, question, or your queries aren't sargeable. Uh, memory helps fix page I.O. latch weight types. Another weight type that you'll see is resource semaphore. Resource semaphore means that queries are waiting on memory before they can even get started. SQL Server's got the execution plan all built, things are ready to go, but they need enough memory in order to run. So SQL Server won't let them start. That's the resource semaphore weight type. Memory fixes that, but it's not really the best fix for that. There are other fixes that are good for that. So now, now that you know a couple of things there, now let's turn it around and ask it the other way. How do you know if you have too much memory? Well, you don't have any page I.O. latch weights at all. You don't have any resource semaphore weights. And users are excessively happy. Or I guess I'm in Iceland. I should use the Bjork song, right? Violently happy. Violently happy. I love that song. Um, if it has, if your users are violently happy and you're not facing any page I.O. latch weights or resource semaphore weights, you probably have more memory than you need. Now, 
What should you do about that? Well, if you start backing down the amount of memory, I, I like playing with Mac server memory because it's one of those things that you could tweak while SQL Server is even up and running. You don't have to shut down the server to do it. You can drop Mac server memory. I'm not saying it's a good idea, but if you're the kind of person who thinks you have too much memory, you could start by gradually backing down Mac server memory until your users weren't violently happy or until you saw page IO latch weights to an extent acceptable page IO latch weights of an unacceptable level and resource semaphore or resource semaphore query compile weights, but that's what you could go around uh, playing around with. All right, next up we have, uh, let's see here, next up is Muchacho. Muchacho says, do you notice big performance impacts on databases that are very normalized as to compared to tables with minimum normalization? Does heavy normalization help with indexes because it uses more numbers to reference foreign keys? You don't really want to normalize or denormalize to fix a performance problem unless it's a last resort. Because when you change table structures, you also have to change the queries. I would suck as a G surgeon. Good to see you, uh, Amsterdam in the house. Um, so I would suck as a performance tuner consultant if I walked in the door, if I came in and I was like, oh, everyone, your table designs are all wrong. We should normalize this. We should denormalize that. It'll take me about three years to fix all the queries in the applications. Users would be furious. Users would be so pissed off. So I wouldn't go to normalization or denormalization as here's what's causing the problem. What I would do is just say, okay, here are the table structures that were given. Now, given those table structures, how can I change indexes, change queries, change the server hardware uh, in order to get the best bang for the buck? I know a lot of database administrators out there like to come in and say, this is all wrong. You should redo everything. But you'll find that you get a whole lot more uh, further in your career if you try to make the tiniest, the least invasive change possible and look like a, an amazing performance ninja. That'll be a bigger bang for the buck for you. Um, B. Arman says, are you actually solving the problem then or working around it? You're working around it. So? Right? Like I've seen how unorganized your office is. That office is a hot mess. Your stuff is all over everywhere. Your files aren't alphabetized. You're not folding your socks correctly. Your clothes drawers just disgusting. You're not washing your sheets the right way. Have you seen on TikTok there are people who will teach you how to fold your clothes? You're not doing any of that correctly. In life, we're all about trying to make the fewest changes possible, like nothing else matters, the fewest changes possible in order to have the biggest bang for the buck possible. Don't try to say, I want to fix everything flawlessly, because then they're going to look at how your own stuff is, and they're going to be like, oh, you're pot calling the kettle black there. Uh, yeah, exactly. Adam nails it right there. Next up, Victor asks, what metrics could we show to business people? Just as a side note, try not to use the term guys because it's, I don't want to say sexist, but it's not inclusive. And I know you meant everyone. Say folks instead, F-O-L-K-S. That's much more inclusive. So where, what are metrics could we show to the business people when they ask you, how's the database performance? Oh, that's such a good question. Uh, I'm glad that y'all upvoted this. They're not technical people. It seems that they want to see that we're improving the database performance consistently. Oh, yes. Oh, that's such a good question. Oh, I just absolutely, I love that question. It's fantastic. So they, they hired you kind of for a reason, and they want to measure you somehow. Business people are really obsessed with you get what you measure. They measure their revenues, their costs, their uh, profit, their taxes every year. They measure all kinds of expenses and numbers. So what you want to ask them is, all right, what's the most important thing for you? 
do you want the server to go faster? Is there some kind of query that you want me to measure? I've worked with some clients where we've said the checkout process needs to happen in less than a certain number of milliseconds, for example. And they are happy when checkouts take less than, let's say, 400 milliseconds. And I'm, ta I'm not talking about the human process of clicking through things to check out. I'm talking about the, uh, the process of submitting a, a URL and seeing how quickly the results come back. Other companies, they're less concerned about performance and they're much more about how do we cut costs. This often happens when they're internally facing systems and people don't really care about performance as much. They're much more about how do we reduce the cost of, of uh, servicing our employees, of, bringing, of rendering web pages. And in that case, they may be more obsessed around your annual licensing spend. So ask them what's most important to them. Generally, when I'm working with clients, it's about either reducing their expenditures, which means looking at how many applications can we cram into a SQL server at a really low cost, or they're all about performance. Like, it, I don't want to say money isn't an object, but they have specific goals for specific web pages or business processes that they want to happen in a certain amount of time. But they're the ones who drive that. Um, one other thing I would say too, if you report into a big IT organization, another uh, pair of numbers that uh, general IT managers like to look at is RPO and RTO. RPO and RTO's recovery point objective and recovery time objective, how much data you would lose during an outage and how long you would be down for. And there are all kinds of cool ways to measure that. If you search for my name and RPO and RTO, I've got uh, lots of blog posts about how that kind of thing works. Next up, Chico Chico asks, what's the best criteria for creating indexes? Do the SSMS index recommendations do any good? You know, there are some questions that I can ask, answer in a matter of like 60 to 90 seconds and we're out the door. Some of them require entire training courses, and that's actually what that one is. So I have, if you go to brentozar.com and click training up at the top, I have a one-day class on fundamentals of index tuning. Yes, where I bring out Mr. Clippy, as Dal Beer says. I have a one-day class on fundamentals of index tuning. Take that, but then wait a few days or weeks. Then I have a three-day class on mastering index tuning that goes into much more details. But you want the, the basics from fundamentals to sink in first before you go in and do the mastering class. In that class, I explain how SQL Server management, how SQL Server builds the missing index recommendations, the kinds of situations where they're wrong, and how you can use those to build better ones. Great questions. Oh, Hecatron uh, says uh, 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 those index classes are so good. Thank you. Woohoo! Appreciate it. Uh, oh, David says, uh, David from Tegucigalpa uh, says, uh, thank you for all you do for the community in answering these questions. Muchos gracias. De nada, David, I, or David, I should say. I appreciate uh, that. It's funny, I bet you're wearing something a lot different than I'm wearing uh, today. This would probably, I would probably burst into flames as I, if I was uh, down in Mexico today. Today it is, I don't have Celsius set up. I want to say it's like 17 Celsius in Reykjavik. And to be honest, the only reason I'm wearing this sweater is I bought a whole bunch of Icelandic sweaters and I really love them. And I'm like, if I'm in Iceland, I should totally have this on a webcast. But I am burning alive here, even in Iceland, the things that I do for fashion and for y'all. Ah, oh, my pleasure, George, my pleasure. Next up, we have Simon. Simon asks, whoops, let me uh, do a couple of things there. So Simon asks, in your top 10 mistakes that developers make that don't scale, you say that you're not a fan of GUIDs. Are they a better choice for primary keys than an identity column in a high concurrency OLTP database because they enable faster inserts of new records? Oof. Okay, so let me ask you a different question, Simon. Do you have indexes on your tables? Sounds like a stupid question, but bear with me. Let's say you got a customer's table. I bet on your customer's table, you have an index on name, email address. You have another index on address, maybe an index on phone number. 
those indexes are slowing down your inserts because you think, just based on what your question is, you think that GUIDs are going to insert faster because they randomly spray data everywhere. Okay, great, but you realize that you also have impacts from all of your indexes too, where we have to maintain all that overhead. I find that people get so obsessed over the order of their primary key, and then they totally forget about the all the overhead of all the non-clustered indexes they have. I've walked into shops that have 10, 20, 30 indexes on tables, and they're so obsessed over the primary key. I'm like, screw that. Go look at your non-clustered indexes. We could get rid of half of these things right here and make your in inserts go 10 times faster or more. And we show you that during the fundamentals of index tuning classes and mastering index tuning classes. Um, so I, 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 I uh, go against the premise of your question. I don't agree with that at all. Until you hit a thousand inserts per second sustained on the same table. If you have one table where you're doing a thousand inserts per second sustained, I'm not talking about peak workloads, I'm talking about around the clock, a thousand per second is your minimum number, then you can start playing around with things like clustered index changes. But until then, hold that thought and your better bang for the buck is non-clustered index changes. Next up, let's see what Chris asks. Let's see here. Have a sip of my tasty beverage here. Mm. Hi, uh, Abinov. Uh, that's an interesting name there. Abinov Daily Logs. Is logs like a reference to how you poop? Are you like showing off the fact that you're regular? I, I'll give you a hand. That's good that you're regular. Fiber is important. Um, it's cr back to Chris. So Chris asks, I don't know why anyone continues to watch this show. Uh, Chris asks, given a physical uh, machine, a VM is not an option in multiple databases, would it be preferable to split databases into smaller groups on multiple instances or keep all the databases on a single instance? I will take a single instance all day, every day because it's so much easier to deal with performance peaks and, and valleys. Like sometimes one database will burst and it'll need a lot of horsepower temporarily. It's easier troubleshooting. There are so many things that are much easier when you're dealing with just one instance. I hate instance stacking. I won't even take a tomorrow. <laughs> funny. Um, I won't even take a, uh, a client doing instance stacking. I get that there are economic reasons to do it, but that's where I'm like, virtual machines make so much more sense. I would never say that instant stacking is an option where virtual machines are not. That's just backwards. I would, I would back up and question why virtual machines aren't an option. <laughs> David, whoopsh, there we go. But, but Chris, it's a great question. Like I, I totally understand where you're coming from. I would just go with single instance myself. Um, Let's see here. Next up, Arriba Arriba asks, uh, do integer primary keys and foreign keys help with performance? I'm going to set us, I'm going to assume that you mean primary, you've already got clustered indexes, but now you're wondering whether or not you should put in primary keys and foreign keys. There are super rare edge cases where foreign keys can help but they are super rare and I'm going to say something controversial that's just going to get me lambasted by my peers but it is what it is I'm not here to make friends I'm here to tell you what I've learned over the course of the years I have had to pull out foreign keys more often than I've had to put them in the reason why is that remember how a few minutes ago I was talking about a thousand inserts per second sustained well when you get over a thousand batch requests a second sustained 5,000, 10,000 batch requests a second. There's overhead on all these foreign keys because every time you go to insert a row, update a row, delete a row, SQL Server has to go check all the relevant foreign keys and there are overheads inside of that. Uh, George, that's, a, that's an interesting thing. Uh, so that uh, that is an interesting, it's not the way that I interpreted the question, but I love that question too. And I'll, I'll answer that too afterwards. Um, so there are super rare edge cases where foreign keys can help. 
in my mastering index tuning class, I kind of debunk the bejesus out of that. But if you search for foreign keys on brentozar.com, both me and Eric Darling have written a bunch of blog posts showing how they don't usually make real world queries all that faster. Now, every now and then I'll see them being useful. Here's my general takeaway rule. When you're building a brand new database from scratch, you should use foreign keys. And I don't really give a damn whether you use integers or whether you use GUIDs or even you know, all kinds of other combinations of data types. I talk about how you choose clustering keys in the mastering index tuning class. But when you're just beginning uh, an application for the first time, here's what I would tell clients. Use an identity column. Use that as your primary key on every table just as a starting point and put in foreign keys to help SQL Server understand how your data relates to each other. Because in the beginning, when you first get started building an application, that's when the application is the most likely to accidentally insert bogus data or update bogus data. And having foreign keys helps prevent that. But if you find yourself hitting the point where you're at a thousand batch requests a second or higher, don't be surprised if you have to remove some of the foreign keys due to their overhead. And if you have an existing database, don't be the kind of DBA who walks in and says, we need foreign keys everywhere. I'm going to put them all in. Because what you're going to find is that there's a bunch of garbage data in the application already. And they're going to look at you to figure out how to solve it. And you're just adding more busy work on yourself than you originally had. And nobody's going to thank you for it when that's over. Uh, next up, oh, y'all are just asking all kinds of indexing questions today. Matt says, is there a benefit to having an identity column on a table if it's not used in any queries or joins? In the mastering index tuning class, I go into what the benefits of clustered indexes are, how they work, and how it helps SQL Server understand how to organize and sort your data. If you don't have an identity column starts at one and goes up to a bajillion that you want to use as a clustering key, that's okay. Pick something. Pick something that's static, unique, narrow, and ideally ever increasing. S U N E, static, unique, narrow, and ever increasing. And in the Mastering Index Tuning class, I talk about where those guidelines come from, and I show you how each of them improves performance. You don't have to do all of them. For example, GUIDs aren't ever increasing. But the more of the sunny principles, sunny, static, unique, narrow, and ever increasing, the more of them that you follow, generally the easier of a time performance management you're going to have with indexes. Next up, we have F and F DBA. F and F DBA says I have a select query running on multiple sessions. One of them is runnable, and the other nine are suspended. Um, with the same SPID, well, hold on. That that doesn't make sense because you're saying multiple sessions with the same SPID. That's not how SQL Server works. Here's what I think is probably happening. Whenever you see queries running from one SPID, if it's the same query and it's running multiple times, if you run tools like SP Who is Active or SP Blitz Who, and they show one line plus several others for the same SPID, what's happening is the query's going parallel. And with parallelism, what's likely happening, it's tough to see without the actual execution plan, but based on what you're asking in the question, this is what it feels like is happening one of the threads is still working while the rest are finished. In that case, the query is not really blocking itself. It's just that SQL Server didn't choose to balance the work evenly across all of the threads. If you want to kind of prove that out, what you could do is you could run the query with option max.dop1. And if you run it with max.dop1, it's going to go single threaded. There are cases where lower max.dop numbers actually run faster for specific queries. You may have an issue where SQL Server is doing unbalanced parallelism. Try running the query with option max.dop1 and see if it's faster. 
Am I saying that option max stop equals one is always the right answer? No, 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 of course not. In a perfect world, we tune the queries or tune the indexes. And I teach you how to do that in the mastering classes. But some people can't afford my mastering classes. I totally get it. They're expensive. Because I'm not cheap. I'm not crappy. Generally, the good things cost you money. And I cost a lot of money. Just kidding. Uh, but we go into the details on that on the parallelism classes. If option max stop one, or in the mastering query tuning classes, if option max stop one gets you across the finish line, just use option max stop one. And then if you want to learn more about it, go hit my mastering query tuning classes. Oh. All right, so folks, for your questions, make sure to go read the instructions up at the top of the screen. I helpfully hid them right there at the very top of the screen to make them easy for you to find. I understand that some of us have very short attention spans, but hopefully it's, it's just two lines. You'll be able to, to pull that off. Ooh, thank you, Matthew. I just got a haircut today. Oh, yes, I just got a haircut today, as a matter of fact. So shout out to, I can't remember my Reykjavik barber's name, but just went to a new barber today for the first time. Next up, let's see here, Kakara, Kakara, Kakara do? That's such a cool name. Kakraradu. Kakraradu. That's it. Oh, that's so cool. Kakraradu asks, uh, we have many applications and currently they're sharing the same databases in the same tables. Should we look at breaking up this database? I'm worried about data duplication. Oh, oh, oh that's a good question. So I kind of hinted at this with one of the earlier answers. You want to make as few changes as practical in order to get the biggest bang for the buck possible. If you were talking about over a terabyte worth of data, then I might be interested, or if you were worried that it was going to hit a terabyte of data. But if it's under a terabyte of data, it's not really that big a data anymore. I, I keep a backup database or a backup uh, drive here just as a kind of reminder for clients. This is one terabyte. You can buy these on Amazon for like $200. So just keep that in perspective when you think about worrying about data duplication. I'm not saying that all storage is cheap, but if you're dealing with less in a terabyte it's just not usually worth that much. I'll say that you are dealing with a terabyte or longer or terabyte or more. What should you start thinking about? What you think about is you think about where the data would need to be restored to in terms of a point in time. Do you have some data that could be restored to a different point in time or it would be OK if you lost some of that data? I'll give you a great example. Logging tables and reporting tables. Logging tables and reporting tables tend to be large, and they also tend to have a kind of low value because you could recreate that data or it's really low business value. Start as you're building new tables, and I'm just talking about new tables. When you're building new tables, look at their uh, or interview with the developers creating them and say, hey, could we put that in a separate lower value database? Call it our reporting database or our logging database. But just know that when you restore multiple databases together with SQL Server, it's really hard to get them at the exact same point in time when you're dealing with cross database transactions. Next up, we have, uh, let's see here, Breno Zar Jr. <laughs> says, what's the best data type for primary keys? As I kind of suggested with the Sunny principles, integers. Integers driven by an identity uh, default will be static, unique, narrow, and ever increasing. And we discuss that in much more detail over in the mastering uh, index tuning class. Uh, next up, we have Ray. Ray says, should I be setting read committed snapshot to on in my local environment since that's the default for Azure SQL databases? I assume that you mean that your production database is in Azure SQL DB. And in that case, yes. Uh, if your production database is in Azure SQL DB, you want to make your local development environment behave as similarly as possible. So RCSI on will help mimic what Azure SQL DB is doing. I just want to give you a gotcha warning there, though. The SQL Server doesn't necessarily behave like Azure SQL DB because your Azure SQL DB might have a totally different core count, a different amount of memory. 
And there are different behaviors up in Azure SQL DB than you get in the on-premises boxed product. So just, do, you can't make execution plans match exactly. I'll give you an example, scalar function inlining. I don't think that SQL Server, that Azure SQL DB has still turned on uh, SQL function inlining or scalar function inlining yet, even in Azure SQL DB today. So, whereas it's on by default in SQL Server 2019 with compatibility level 150 or higher. Next up, we have Wee Wee Dar asks, we have a third party, uh, oops, let me clean up a couple of things here. There we go. We have a third party software and we host the database on our own VM. Performance is garbage. Database size is gigabytes. I don't know what that, what that means. Um, did I, vendor blames on network activity? I don't see much activity on the server. What can I do? Oh, that's a great question. So the, the first place that you start whenever you're troubleshooting SQL Server performance is weight statistics. Weight statistics, SQL Server is constantly tracking what it's waiting on, and I'll show you how to query it. So if we go over here, if I go over into, I've got a SQL Server here, the version doesn't matter, all versions behave the same way. If I go into SQL Server and I type, Whoopsie daisy, let me get this. Dag nabbit, I'm hitting every possible different keyboard combination when all I really wanted, there it goes, all I really wanted, he's acting all slow now, SP Blitz first since startup equals one. If you run SP Blitz first since startup equals one, the SP Blitz first is part of our open source first responder kit. If you Google for SP Blitz first, there are instructions on how to download it, how to install it. Uh, totally safe to run in production environments. I do it with emergency troubleshooting all over the world. And then look at what your top weight types are. Now in my server tuning, <laughs> the zoom in and out is completely freaking out today on remote desktop. In my mastering server tuning class, I teach you how to interpret those. But the one that you're looking for is async network IO. If async network IO is your top weight type, then it does mean that networking is an issue with your SQL Server. It do, that, that's not the only possible answer. Sometimes it can be that applications are dragging too much data across the network. Sometimes they're doing select star when they don't really need to. They're bringing back data that they don't need. But just to verify, that's the first starting place that I would go. SP Blitz first, since startup equals one, will show you your weight set stats since your server started up. And if your number one weight type is async network IO, then the vendor might be on to something. If your weight type is something else, then the vendor may be on something, as in smoke <laughs> crack or something to that effect. All right, let's see what the next uh, most highest voted question is here. Uh, so we will, uh, oh, we did, we, we dars followed up with the database size is one gigabyte. It's entirely possible that, uh, that uh, networks is, is the deal. So do what I just said there in terms of the answer. Next up, Lars. Lars says, we need to move away from documents stored as XML in the database oh. um, to something external. Any thoughts on how to achieve this? So you start by just working with your developers. And whenever the developers want to store things inside the database, you put them somewhere else. Look, they, they, they can't all be long questions, right? I don't have a magic wand. I mean, I got like an Apple pencil, but I can wave it around. It doesn't really do anything. If you want to store your data, your data somewhere else, you just start storing your data somewhere else. I can't believe six people upvoted that question. What on earth? I'm not saying it's a bad question. It's a bad question. Next up, we have uh, Melina Sharma asks, I've been watching a lot of SQL performance related videos. All the videos talk about is adding an index or tuning a query, but I have to tune a whole database which has more than a thousand stored procedures, each of which have its own logic. Any recommendations on where I should begin? Oh, absolutely. So uh, where you begin is number one, find your server's top bottleneck. Number two, find the queries 
causing that bottleneck. Oh man, I, I wish that this was really easy, like I could teach you in the span of 60 seconds. I'm going to get you started, but really this is the core of where my mastering server tuning class comes in. So, you know how just a second I said for somebody else's answer, I said go run SP Blitz first, sense startup equals one, and I said this will tell you what your top weight type is. Then, based on what your top weight type is, you can run SP Blitz Cache sort order equals, and then you can't put in the top, you can't put in the weight type name. You have to know if it's CPU related, storage related, memory related, or so forth. But what SP Blitz Cache will do is it'll give you your top 10 most resource intensive queries sorted by this sort order, like we'll sort by CPU, by which queries read the most data, which queries took the longest, all kinds of stuff like that. So hopefully that at least gets you started. If all else fails, you could just start with SP Blitz cache sort order equals CPU, and that'll give you your queries that are burning the most CPU power. But I just get worried about people working really hard on working through these top 10 queries because your bottleneck may not actually be CPU. Your server's CPUs might be sitting around not doing anything. That's where my mastering server tuning classes teach you how to understand what your top bottleneck is and then how to focus the, on the queries that are causing that bottleneck. There you go. Yeah, all right. It is. It does seem much easier said uh, than done, and we go into all the intricacies over in mastering server tuning. All right, next up, uh, Andreas says, will SQL Server 29 UTF-8 support be a game changer in terms of storage and performance? No. When I hear the term game changer, what that means for me is everyone needs to immediately report to training because this is going to change the way that you do databases. This is going to change the way that you do performance tuning. Throw the old rules away and there are all new rules in town. It is not, it's a tiny feature. I get that somebody in Microsoft worked really hard on it and they're they're really proud. Oh, that last note was from Michael J. Swart. I just now happened to see it would go. Welcome to the uh, class, sir. Not class, but session, whatever. I, I get that somebody at Microsoft worked really hard on UTF-8 support, and I get that there are dozens, maybe hundreds of environments in the world where it helps, but it's not like even in the places where it helps, people are going, stop the presses, change everything, everyone report into training at once, this changes the game. It, it doesn't, it's just a feature. It's just something, it's a, it's a tool at your disposal that you can use. Um, I'll give you an example of changing the game, Azure SQL DB. Azure SQL DB changes the game because now, depending on how much you spend, there are hard-coded limits on a lot of resources like transaction log I.O. or TempDB space, and you have to change the first things that you look at when you go and approach it. Your Azure SQL DB can restart at any time, and you don't know when it did. That changes the way that you do monitoring. You have to be much more vigilant about collecting statistics at the right time because they just simply disappear here, your index usage data may not be available or useful to you at the time that you go to tune indexes, for example. When you move from SQL Server to Azure SQL DB, that is what I would call a game changer. And I didn't say it made the game better, it just changes the game. And I'm not saying Azure SQL DB is bad, it's wonderful, it's amazing, I'm really excited for it, I'm legally obligated to say that, I'm not really legally obligated to say that. All right, next up we have Joshua. Joshua asks, what's the best way to find out which query has filled up TempDB data files? If this cannot be done retrospectively, then what about the best way to detect or prevent future issues? So unless you put something in ahead of time, there's no logging in SQL Server to say what query used TempDB space 15 minutes ago. Once that query finishes, that's the end of that. While the query is running live, 
you can run SP who is active. If you Google for SP who is active, I've got a training video out there showing to you, totally free out on YouTube. Um, but a brilliant open source free stored procedure from Adam Mechanic. And when you run it, one of the columns in the output is tempdb allocations which if I remember right, shows you the number of 8K pages that the query has uh, used up in tempdb. Now the thing is though, so one, one thing that I could say is if you want to troubleshoot it after the fact, what you could do is log uh, SP who is active to table every five minutes or however often you want to do it. And if you search for uh, Brentos are log uh, SP who is active to a table, there are instructions out there written by Tara Kaiser uh, who explains how to do that as well. So you could go back and look over time and see which session was gradually using up more and more tempdb allocations until the query disappeared. So the, the thing is though, queries aren't the only uh, thing that can fill up tempdb. The version store is another classic example. Triggers are another classic example. Uh, and I show you how to troubleshoot those in my fundamentals of tempdb class. But start with logging SP who is active to table first, because you can probably find it. Let's be honest, most of the time that when it's happening, it's because some bozo is building a temp table uh, that's trying to process the entire data warehouse over in tempdb because they read a bad blog post once. Uh, Arun, uh, the answer to your question is cleverly hidden at the top of the page there, right up there at the top. And believe it or not, that's that's actually the, the answer right there. So that's where you go. Next up, ha ha ha, make it rain asks, will there be a SQL Server 2021 or 2022? Anyone who knows can't say which also tells you that anyone who says can't know. I am not saying that I know, because I don't. But let me tell you what I think is going to happen. For several years, Microsoft uh, SQL Server team was talking about how they were going to ship updates faster and faster, that they were going to have this fast train of updates, and they were going to ship a, a cumulative update every month, and then every 12th month, they were going to drop a brand new version. And I'm like, uh, 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 time out, that vendors can't support things that quickly. You can't have, like if we're going to support SQL Server for five years, we can't have five different major versions of SQL Server out there. They're like, shut up, get out of the way of the fast train, fast train coming through, you're going to be a caboose, sucker. And I'm like, okay, good luck with that. And at first it looked like they were going to try to pull it off. They got SQL Server 2016, then they shipped SQL Server 2017, and then they shh. The train started slowing down a little bit because they couldn't get 2019 out the door and, uh, fast enough. And if you watch, when they were bringing 2019 out, parts were falling off the train. They were like, we have availability groups in Kubernetes. Oh, wait, we can't make that happen in time. We're running out of time. So they started shoveling features out, uh, out the door off the train, throw, uh, throw Kubernetes from the train. Oh, there are so many funny jokes inside there. Uh, so they ended up dropping support for stuff on the way out the door and they still couldn't get it in within a year. It's now August of 2021. Traditionally, when Microsoft shipped SQL Server in the past, they would do three to six months worth of, uh, worth of previews before they actually shipped the final version. It would be really hard for them to get a SQL Server 2021 out the door. It's doable, it's possible, but they would have to start announcing it today, like they got to start getting their hustle on. What I think is going to happen is that they're going to consider SQL Server to be the box product to be more stable and that they're going to release it less often and that they're going to focus the fast train up on Azure SQL DB, which is really frankly smart. With Azure SQL DB, they don't have to worry about walking you through installing it or having problems with an installer or teaching you how to use availability groups or teaching you how to use CLR support because none of that stuff is up in Azure SQL DB. They can just iterate really quickly up in Azure SQL DB, learn their lessons and the parts that don't work, then they don't uh, ship those out to the box product. And that's kind of the end of that. Next up, uh, Richard asks, wow, that's an interesting question. What's the best way to implement version control on a database schema? 
I don't do any version control work at all, but I'll tell you who does. Alex Yates. Alex Yates is out of the United Kingdom and he does a lot of d database lifecycle management work. So if you search for Alex Yates DLM, as in database lifecycle management, he's the person to ask about that. He's on Twitter, he's super approachable, a really nice guy, complete uh, sharp uh, person. But he's the one of the few people in the world who can tell you the pros and cons of lots of the different solutions out there. Next up, Caboose asks, uh, funny that it's uh, Caboose. Um, Caboose asks, what's a single SQL Server upgrade or tuning thing that will yield the best bang for the money? Indexes. Indexes. Because indexes will fix so many terrible problems. You don't have to change the code. You don't have to get approval from management to go and buy new hardware. You don't have to worry about long upgrade uh, to, uh, times. When you add in things like memory, you often have to add it into the production box, plus your high availability boxes, plus your disaster recovery. It gets really expensive, especially when people are renting their boxes either in colo or from the cloud. <laughs> Adam says, missing an, an uh, opportunity. You should have said higher Brenos are. No, because I'll tell you what. So index tuning would be the number one. And the way that I would go about doing it is attend one of my training classes. See what I did there? Because it's much cheaper to attend one of my training classes than it is to actually hire me. You can go watch my mastering index tuning class. Watch fundamentals first. I know so many people would go try to jump into the mastering one. They're like, whoa, I didn't realize I didn't even know the fundamentals. Um, so go watch the fundamentals one first. It's like 89 bucks. It's really cheap. Then go watch the mastering index tuning class. You can do both of those in less than it costs to hire me. That's the most cost effective one. Next up, let's see here. Wanna be a DBA says I've had five. Uh, let's see here. I've had five transaction or a different primary key transaction. What on earth? I run a query, any solution. I don't even understand what you're asking. Uh, logical reads of more than a thousand. A thousand logical reads is nothing. Remember, a page, I usually keep a printed page here, a one logical read equals one 8K page. So you're talking about a thousand pages, that's eight megabytes. Eight megabytes. Eight megabytes. Nobody gives a damn about reading eight megabytes. I mean, like you get to some edge case. If you're running Amazon shopping cart, then sure, you care about things like that. But a thousand logical reads, who gives a damn? Just ship that thing, go. That's, that's totally fine. Don't sweat it. Next up, Drew says, we have too many agent jobs doing far too much and everything, everybody thinks they need to be able to manage them. Until that now, it's been give, uh, accomplished by giving people uh, uh, sysadmin access. I've tried all the built-in roles and none of them will suffice. Do you have any suggestions? Oh man, this rings a bell. Post this on Stack Overflow or dba.stackexchange because there's an answer to it, and I don't know what it is because I don't do security work, but I am vaguely remembering that around 2019, something dropped uh, in the way of giving you more granular permissions for SQL Server agent, and I don't remember what it was. Um, you might even find it by looking at built-in SQL Server roles, uh, built-in SQL Server roles in the SQL Server 2019 books online, because I want to say it showed up there. But if not, go to dba.stackexchange. And the way that I would phrase it is, always try to boil down your question to the simplest part of it. The way that I would phrase it is, what's the minimum amount of permissions required under SQL Server 2019 to manage SQL Server agent jobs? And that'll get you the answer uh, very quickly. Next up, uh, Bruski says, what do you think about Pinal de Dave's approach? I don't know. Can you be any less specific? If you could be just more broad, please don't give me any information. The best questions just ask things like how you you're almost that vague. You're not quite there. You got a little bit more work than you can do. But if you could just get a little bit more vague, I'll certainly be able to ignore your question even faster.
And then, ooh, we're coming up near the top of the hour. We'll only get a couple more questions in. Um, Philip says, uh, we have an application that is connecting to a database through this SA account. I don't want this to continue, and I wonder how best it is to determine what permissions are actually required for the application to work. The vendor no longer supports the application. Oh, that's such a tricky question. So what you're really asking is, is, is there a way to audit everything that queries do and I don't know of an easy way to do that because what would happen if the application has a function built in that only runs once a month or it only runs when the users actually go and run that particular function it might do things like truncate tables it might change max stop i have seriously seen an application that goes and changes max stop to one temporarily while it goes and accomplishes certain tasks and then pops it up to unlimited so i don't know of an easy way to audit all of the permissions that a specific application needs but if you wanted to try if you wanted to go and change uh, uh, just to give it a shot to see what would happen I would start by saying, give that, give, build them a brand new login, give that login permissions to be the database owner of the application of the uh, database where it's working on, give them full absolute permissions on that one specific database, but nothing else. And then wait and see if people come back and complain and say, oh, we're having problems with this application because we can't do whatever. If you wanted to get ambitious, you could try to uh, you could try to log every time there's an error from that login. I just I'd be really hesitant to do that because of course you're going to run into all kinds of other application errors from it. And then we'll take one more. So let's see here. Uh, Ralph says, uh, and I'll go ahead and stop taking questions from now. Let's assume we have two different networks in a three node cluster. We have one node in our primary site and two nodes in the DR site. My question is, will the cluster survive if network splits occurs and I don't have any witnesses? In other words, what is a witness a must for a multi subnet cluster? Oh man, this is so big that you don't want to take somebody's advice just over a live stream. You really want to sit down and sketch out what's going to happen when the network drops, what's going to happen when our DR site disappears, what's going to happen when the primary site disappears, what failures do we want to be automatic, what failures do we want to be manual. Then based on that, you can change the number of votes that each member of the cluster gets. I get really nervous in your configuration where you have one in the primary data center and two in DR, because by default, if you have a network blip, the primary is coming down. So you either want to take away the votes from DR, or you should just expect that the primary is going down whenever the network split happens. So I'd just be really nervous with that kind of thing. All right, there is about an hour's worth of questions and answers there. Hopefully y'all had fun and learned something. I am now going to go out and go have some dinner. It's about 5 o'clock p.m. here in Reykjavik. And uh, I heard my wife get home a little bit while ago, so uh, off we go. Thanks y'all for hanging out with me, and I will see y'all at another Office Hours. Adios.